Ginger Campbell is going to come out and do uh, Why Neuroscience Matters. And unfortunately, I haven't had a chance to write uh, a limerick, but I hope that's okay. I'll do one post-script, so we'll do it. So please welcome uh, Ginger Campbell. Okay. Karen's slides will be working eventually. Um, so I'm going to be talking about some, some basic discoveries from neuroscience. And my goal is to tell you some cool stuff, but also to make you get interested in learning more. And most importantly, I want to convince you that neuroscience literacy is becoming an essential um, scientist, science literacy for the 21st century. So first I want to just thank those of you in the skeptic community who have supported my show over the years. I had a promo on an early on in Skepticality, so I know a lot of you have been listening for a long time, so I just wanted to say thanks. So why should you even care? Um, well, neuroscience is about what makes us human, and if you're not interested in that, I guess you wouldn't be here. And we're learning things that are really changing how we see ourselves. I'm going to start just by actually telling you what neuroscience is, because it's actually a pretty broad. Am, am I too close to the mic? Okay. I've never used this kind before, so OK. So it might seem obvious, but it is the scientific study of ner nervous systems. And that's opposite from, say, neurobiology, which is more down at the physics, chemistry, biology level. This is a systems level field. It, according to Wikipedia, has at least 15 branches, and it ranges from the molecular biological level all the way up to the uh, level of behavior and cognition. And it's um, very interdisciplinary. It uses tools from many fields, ranging from molecular biology all the way up to computer science. In fact, I think the more I read, the more I'm convinced that Neuroscience is leading the 21st century trend back toward interdisciplinary science. Um, you also hear the term cognitive science, which really is about the studying the mind, information processing. It's associated with, traditionally, with the term computational theory of mind. It includes, because it's by definition interdisciplinary, it includes psychology, uh, linguistics, philosophy, and computer science. So you often will hear people refer to neuroscience and cognitive science, because among the scientists themselves, those are considered separate. So back to why you should care. Like I said, it's about what makes us human. And we're learning things that are really changing how we see ourselves and others, including other non-human um, animals. Um, sorry. So as I said, I'm going to talk about a few key discoveries. I've been doing the Brain Science Podcast since 2006, so I've done over 100 episodes, which of course I realize is not a lot compared to those of you who podcast every week. but. Um, I feel like I'm only scratched the surface. So I picked a few people that have done work that you probably haven't heard about that I hope will give you a feel for the depth and breadth of the field. We are learning a lot about brain evolution. It's its own topic. And one of the people whose work I'm going to talk about today is Seth Grant. He's in the UK. And he's actually, him and his colleagues, have proven that the proteins that make up the synapse, which is the main connection between neurons, um, that these proteins actually evolve before nervous systems. So we're talking about things like, uh, and, and also the chemicals like dopamine, of course, have been around forever. Another thing is that you take C. elegans, which is a very primitive nematode worm. We share about 50% of our genes with that worm. Uh, Personally, I think that genetic information should be enough to convince you of evolution, but apparently not for some people. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about C. elegans in just a minute. So here is um, a slide that Seth Grant 
graciously shared with me, it sort of shows the idea that communication began when single cell organisms had proteins embedded in their cell membranes and they could interact with the world. That was the beginning uh, of things like dopamine, glutamate, stuff like that that you hear about even today. So he calls this the protosynapse. Then the way he describes it, and he's an excellent teacher, you, you go from the protosynapse, which is what's going on in the cell membrane, to the actual synapse in a invertebrate, it's pretty primitive, and then as you get to vertebrates like us, it becomes more complex. It turns out, and this has been proven with proteomics, that the complex elements of the synapse evolved before we got big brains. And this is a big deal because it goes against what we've sort of, well, maybe not against, but it challenges the assumption that it's all about how big your brain is. It may be, I think the evidence is leaning to the idea that the complex synapse was the key to being able to get brains and big brains. So I originally talked with Seth Grant um, back in 2008, I think, and since then he's been doing a lot of exciting work, and I talked to him last, at the end of last year, and we did an update. Unfortunately, he didn't have a chance to give me any slides, but I want to tell you about what he's discovered. So let me see if I can. It's more about the synapse complexity. Like I said, vertebrate synapses are more complex than invertebrate synapses. And so this, as I said, just um, challenges the whole thing about big brains. But the real question is, well, how did this happen? I mean, how do, how do we get a complex synapse? It turns out it has to do with um, the duplication of the entire genome, which actually occurred twice in evolution, and I'm talking the entire genome of some ancient organism early on in um, vertebrate uh, evolution. This is really, I don't understand why I never heard of this before because it's kind of important to evolution. Have you ever wondered, well, you know, how could you get those um, mutations that you needed to make vertebrates without really killing the invertebrates? And the key was that they duplicated the entire genome and that, as he put it, gives you a whole bunch of extra Lego blocks to work with. And so I'm going to use this example of something called the DLG gene to sort of explain how this works, and it probably applies to a lot of other things too. So the DLG gene is one that's been around since the early mammals, about 100 million years. So we, in invertebrates, you would have had one copy of the gene. Then it doubled and you had two, and then it doubled again, and so then you had four. Now this particular gene is of interest because it affects the protein expression in the synapse. And so the question is, does it matter? So what Grant and his colleagues did was, his training is in uh, genetics and making transgenic mice, which is when they you know, change the genes in the mice and see what happens. And so what they did was they made these different strains of mice where one gene of, this, of these four DLG genes was mutated, and then another strain where another one was, and so on, to see whether it made any difference. I mean, it's a good theory, but first you've got to prove, well, it really actually matters. So what they found was that the very oldest gene, the one that we inherited from invertebrates, if you, get if you mutate it, the animal dies. It's not compatible with life. The second oldest one, if you mutate it, you get severe learning disabilities, you might say. The, 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 two most, the two newest ones seem to have opposing actions. One of them, uh, if you mutate it, the animal learns more slowly, but it has what's called faster extinction, which it's like if you were going to work every week and, after, and they quit paying you, how long would it be before you decided to quit going to work? That's extinction, okay? So these animals have faster extinction, but they're slower learners. You knock out the other gene of the pair, and they 
um, learn faster, but they're really slow about extinction. Actually, I think I, I know some people like that. But um, anyway, they seem, so that, it seems like now that we have these extra genes to play around with, we can have some that are sort of regulating by um, balancing each other. Now, there are people that have a mutation of one of these genes, the one called DLG2. That's actually the reason why they picked this gene to play with, because they already knew about people. Now, I skipped one thing, because I can't really see my notes. Uh, growing old is bad for your reading. Um, one really neat thing that they did was that they developed this test that, where they use this thing like an iPad, and the mouse touches it with its nose you know, when it's doing the trials. And that means they can give the exact same test to people with the iPad-like device. It's not officially an iPad, but it's got a touch screen. And so they've done this, and they've shown that this, the people that they already knew had this deficit have this very similar learning deficits. So that's, that's pretty weird and kind of exciting. Now, this is a mutation that's associated with schizophrenia. And that's not really unusual if you think about the fact that people with schizophrenia tend to have cognitive deficits. So it's really not surprising that a gene associated with schizophrenia would, call, would be involved in, in the synapse. Um, and again, as I mentioned, these genes have been around a long time, but this is evidence that they're still really important uh, in, in learning. And plus this whole line of work is sort of a proof of concept of a way of, te of testing uh, whether a certain gene affects um, behavior. Now the implication, first of all, vertebrates have much more complex behavior than invertebrates. But the point is it's not just because we got big brains. We have more complex synapses. And probably those complex synapses are what makes our big brains possible. Now, those of you who may not have any background in neuroscience might not realize it, but that's really surprising. I mean, we've always thought that the synapse was the synapse was the synapse was the synapse. Turns out it's not true. Fortunately, it's mostly the same enough that we can do studies, you know, on ver invertebrates, but we have to, now that we know this piece of information, any time we're extrapolating from invertebrate data, now we're going to have to take this into account. So the C. elegans that I mentioned before, it's really popular with neuroscientists because for one thing, it's transparent. Another thing is that it's really small, so it's easy to work with in terms of lab space. It reproduces really quickly, and it has a very short lifespan. And so those are all things that scientists like because lab work is really expensive. So C. elegans, much, much cheaper than mice. And I don't think anyone ever gets attached to them either. Um, so it turns out also that, and we know their genome, because the C. elegans, I can't remember if the C. elegans are the, are just, uh, or the fruit fly was sequenced first, but it was one of the very first ones to be have its genome sequence. So we know that, we know a lot about it, and 70% of the um, genes that are associated with human illnesses have homologs in C. elegans. So it's, it's considered a great, what we call a model organism. And as far as its nervous system, it only has 302 neurons, which makes it a lot easier to study than uh, 80 to 100 billion neurons of the human brain. Uh, plus, you can cut it open. <laughs> um, it has similar neurotransmitters, uh, similar ion channels, similar synapses within the um, caveat that I just mentioned. And I, I guess I should mention these slides are from Guy Caldwell at the University of Alabama. Um, it turns out that C. elegans even has seizures, which is pretty bizarre to think of when you consider that C. elegans doesn't even have a brain. Uh, and he, when Guy was sending me his slides originally, he sent me a video of a worm having a seizure, but it's just sitting there wiggling, so I've never put it into my presentation. <laughs> Although I did once have somebody ask me to send them a link to it. I don't know. Um, but you can use the C. elegans to, to test whether genetic changes will affect susceptibility to, to um, seizures. You can use it to check test drugs, which is a really, um, you know, 
efficient way to test drugs because you can eliminate a lot of them before you get to the more expensive testing methods. Now, what Guy does is he's studying the dopamine neurons. It turns out that there's only eight dopamine neurons in us E. elegans. So dopamine neurons are affected in Parkinson's disease, for example. That's, he gets, that's where his funding is from. So he, he can, you can, see, you can label them with fluorescent dye since they're transparent, and then you can uh, see what happens. So this is an example of the difference between healthy dopamine neurons and ones that are degenerating. And the last time I talked to Guy, he was hopeful that they would be able to, that they would ha be able to actually get a simple substance all the way to the point of a drug that people could use for Parkinson's. But I'm not sure where that stands right now. Um, so, uh, I'm gonna back up just a second. I wanna talk a little bit about um, the human brain, because I just gave you those two examples of sort of obscure basic science kinds of things. But the basic science is, is where um, discoveries are made that then change things. For example, now that we know that the synapse is not the same, um, who knows where that's gonna lead. So uh, these are a few of the things that I think are key discoveries in neuroscience or concepts. One has been talked about much today, which is the idea that the brain makes the mind. Brain plasticity is, I think, the most exciting discovery. Um, then the role of the unconscious, which you will hear a lot about, including emotions. I'm only gonna talk on about morality very briefly because I think Patricia Churchland has a whole talk on that. And I unfortunately will only talk about consciousness very briefly, even though obviously that could be its own talk. Um, so the brain makes the mind. You can debate about how important the body is. You can debate about how important the environment is. There are people who think that we should consider, for example, our iPhone in our pocket to be part of our mind because we're using, you know, we're outsourcing stuff to it. But aside from where you might fall on that philosophical argument, there's no doubt that the brain is essential and there's no evidence that you can get by without it. <laughs> um, Robert Burton is someone that I ha regard as a mentor and I like this quote from his first book. Um, Disembodied thought is not a physiological option. And the other point that Burton makes that I think is important is that you also can't have a purely rational mind. And I'll talk about why this is true in just a minute. Brain plasticity, which is more than just the discovery that we can make new neurons, but the discovery that we can make new neurons actually overturned about a century of neuroscience dogma and what's really interesting about that is if you go back and look in the literature, you can find people who did work that provided evidence of neuroplasticity, you know, 50 years ahead of time that, you know, got ignored because it didn't fit what everybody currently thought. And just like uh, Scott Lillenfield said this morning, scientists are just as prone to be stuck in a dogma as anybody else. Um, and actually most of brain plasticity isn't from new neurons because there's only a very few places in the brain where make new neurons. It's really more about uh, new synapses and the, and the synapses changing. And right now we don't really know the weight between those two, which one's the most important. The reason that I think brain plasticity is so exciting is because, for one thing, hope. It gives hope to people for recovery from all kinds of injuries and diseases. And for the rest of us who are hopefully healthy, it means that there's not any excuse for not learning new things as we get older. That's the reason why I just started a fellowship in palliative care medicine 30 years after graduating from medical school. I decided I needed to practice what I preach. So I'm skipping ahead to the unconscious. Um, 
We're learning a lot about the fact that the conscious does, probably most of what our brain does is unconscious. And not only is it unconscious, it is not accessible to introspection. And this is really important because there are people who, this doesn't fit, you know, sort of, um, you know, like the old Freudian idea of the unconscious where you could figure out by dream analysis or some pseudoscience what's in your unconscious. We're talking about stuff that we just don't have any way of getting access to. And this includes the sources of our, our basic emotions. Um, emotions, something scientists used to like to try to ignore, but thanks to Antonio Damasio, we now know that our emotions are important for normal decision making. People who don't have emotions, actually, they can't figure out what's important to them, so they can't make choices. Uh, Jacques Pangsip is a scientist who des deserves more recognition than he's gotten so far. He has shown that we share the basic emotional circuits for our for emotions with other mammals. And the key thing about these circuits is that they are subcortical. It's not at the amygdala, it's way below there, okay? Um, again, these are not things we have access to. You can decide how you're gonna react to your emotions, but you don't get to choose what they are. They, they happen at a level you don't have access to. If you know that, that means you maybe can give yourself a little slack and other people a little slack. <laughs> so the unconscious is doing at least 95% of the work, maybe more. It doesn't just shape our conscious thought, it makes our conscious thought possible. And we know this because people who have damage to these circuits that we would consider unconscious have a very hard time, you know, doing, doing thought in the way that you know, we could normally think of it. So how should we react? My friend Robert Burton again says that our reaction should be humility, because we, it's kind of like we're really not in control, but not in that, oh, now my brain made my, me do it kind of way. I'm, I'm not advocating that position. But it is humbling to realize how much is going on in our unconscious, and stuff we take credit for, you might say, this quote is from Burton's more recent book, A Skeptic's Guide to the Mind, which I highly recommend. One investigator's possible correlation is another's absolute causation. I like this quote because it captures a very important idea. When you're talking about things that are going on in the unconscious or our unconscious processes, these include the origins of things like the feeling of certainty. Um, you, you know when you know the answer. Um, that that's, has an unconscious origin. So do our, our sensations of causality and agency. The agency, these are unconscious. So when we, I know that I heard Michael Shermer give a talk several years ago about the fact that you know, s s people were different in their tendency to see patterns in noise. Well, think of this as a, another aspect of that. So we have uh, varying tendencies to see causality around us. So that's what this quote um, captures. And this is part of the problem with when scientific studies that have shown correlation get out into the press and get morphed into the proof of causation, even though they haven't proved causation. Um, some of it's bad reverse um, uh, whatever that was that Scott said this morning. But the other thing is that people just vary in their idea of when something has become proven. And this is just part of the way that we're wired. So, I mean, even among scientists, there can be, obviously there's the bias of if it's your theory, you're more likely to think it's been proven, but um, so, what are the implications of this? This is another quote from Dr. Burton. He says, hiring the mind as a consultant for understanding the mind is like um, asking a con man to give himself a job reference. <laughs> now, not everybody agrees that this 
is a, a fundamental, puts a fundamental limit on our ability to understand the mind. But um, at least we need to be aware that, you know, a lot of this stuff is going on outside of anything we can access. So besides our unconscious, our, our brains and then our minds are going to be shaped by our genes, our environment, our experience, and um, they all interact. We know that the, the genes can uh, uh, be turned on and off due to experience. And I'm not, I, I realize that I'm, I'm not going to get into morality except to say that we know that we're not the only species that has a sense of fairness. <laughs> and the evidence is that morality has evolved. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that with, with this audience because I know that you're probably familiar with it. Um, when it comes to consciousness, we know now that pro consciousness is now the holy grail of neuroscience which is really pretty ironic if you consider that a few decades ago it was considered scientifically out of bounds, unstudiable, but not anymore. Um, so we're learning it's not maybe as unique as we thought in terms of humans aren't the only beings that are conscious. There's debate about this, but that's where I come down. The big one, the existence of a non-material soul appears to be very unlikely given the evidence from neuroscience. And personally speaking, that's what turned me into an atheist, is, you know, I got into studying neuroscience actually from a philosophical, from the philosophical end, and before I knew it, I was an atheist. <laughs> so I'm kind of on the, on the um, school of you bring the science to people and let them conclude what it means to them in their lives. And the Discovery Institute knows this. They're already attacking neuroscience as materialistic neuroscience, trying to undermine it, because they understand its implications. So, implications for skeptics. As much as we admire the enlightenment ideal of the rational mind, we need to rethink this. You really can't have a pure, rational Mr. Spock mind because emotions are also in our brains, and we need them, and there's a lot of other stuff going on. Um, these discoveries explain why you can't just convince, change somebody's mind, so to speak, by giving them a better argument, because where they are on that spectrum of causation and certainty and all those various things is going to influence how they respond. So as I said, because of this, I think we need neuroscience literacy um, so that we can make better decisions about things like when should kids be allowed to drive and drink and, um, you know, we can avoid scams like something that's going to make you use more of your brain when they tell you you only use 10%, which is totally false. I hope you already, all, already know that. We, we need to reform education. But I think that the most important thing is the promotion of tolerance and understanding. If people have a better understanding of how their minds work and the minds of other people work, a lot of this stuff that we tend to think is people control, like whether you believe in God or not, you do not control, I'm convinced. Um, so I was just wanted to shout out to my other um, TAM speakers, but I don't think they're showing this slide. Um, these are people that have been on my podcast, so if you would like to hear more from them after you hear them talk, I hope you'll track down their, their episodes, especially Carol Tra Tavers' episode about cognitive dissonance. Sorry, Ginger Campbell, thank you so much for switching. Ginger Campbell, Ginger Campbell, yay.